elections will be held within the next few months, that is, general elections. And there are many issues that surround those elections. Those, th those issues will determine who you vote for. Those are some of the is issues that we would like to discuss on this program, Making the Point. I'm your host, so stay with me for the next 57 minutes or so when we discuss some of the issues surrounding elections 2015. With me in the studios for this edition of Making the Point is the Honorable Minister of Finance, Dr. Ashni Singh. Minister, welcome to Making the Point. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much for inviting me. And thanks for accepting the invitation. As it relates to elections 2015, there are several issues. Um, and I know almost most of them, you are at the center of them. The economy, what happens with the economy, what has been happening with it, what is likely to be, to be happening with it. How are you likely to help to stabilize the economy? Well, first of all, Andrew, I must say that in your introductory remarks, you made a definitive statement that elections will be held in 2015. Of course, that depends on what, how things evolve in the parliament and what announcements the president makes in relation to the 10th parliament. Working on the premise that we will end up having an election in 2015, um, I would say that uh, in relation to our economic performance, when one looks back at the recent performance of the economy, I think it's fair to say that the Guyanese economy has done extremely well under very testing circumstances. As you know, the global economy has been in a period of tremendous turbulence and difficulty. The regional economy, Caribbean economy, has, going, has been going through significant trauma as well. We have had uninterrupted positive growth in Guyana now for nine years. And at a time when, particularly over the last three years or so, the domestic political environment has been a very challenging one as well. The fact that we've been able to achieve this uninterrupted growth, I think, is something that uh, redounds to the credit of all Guyanese stakeholders, the government for putting in place a favorable policy environment, but also the investors and the workers who have contributed to this growth. Um, having said that, you are absolutely correct in your the suggestion implicit in your question that the political environment does certainly have the potential to affect the economy. And we're operating in an environment where the opposition has not been shy of disclosing their intentions to, uh, to derail or attempt to subdue the growth in the, growth in the economy. Um, I can say definitively that our go this government, this PPP civic government, is committed to ensuring that we maintain the conditions that are essential for continuing growth, for preserving stability, for creating jobs, for generating income. And we've demonstrated that over the years. Um, and there are numerous indicators that confirm our commitment in this regard and demonstrate our track record in this regard. So your viewers can be assured that party that I have the privilege of representing in the parliament will remain focused on stability and growth in the economy. We will, fo we will be remain focused on preserving a policy environment that will remain attractive to investors, both foreign and domestic, and in turn that will therefore result in the creation of jobs, generation of incomes for Guyanese people, all, you know, in every region of the country. That remains our commitment. You mentioned just now in um, having investors coming to Guyana. You also mentioned stabilizing the economy. Um, worldwide, fuel prices have been dropping. And we haven't seen that affecting when we go to the pump. There's no reflection of that. Well, you may or may not be aware that I announced earlier today a reduction in the price charged for fuel by Guy Oil. Specifically, I announced that gasoline and diesel will be sold for 30% uh, less than they were being sold for previously. And kerosene, the price of kerosene will be reduced by 42%. Um, these announce, th this announcement was made just earlier this afternoon. I know. And 
that the the 30% reduction in the price for gasoline and diesel and the 42% reduction in kerosene uh, and price for kerosene will have an immediate Im a number of immediate impacts first of all an impact on the disposable incomes of those who consume fuel products those who buy petrol whether for their own personal transportation or for whatever other purpose whether it's gasoline or diesel or kerosene even for domestic use will immediately see the their fuel bill when they go to purchase fuel at the gas station immediately see that fuel bill come down but very importantly to those in business particularly those say in agriculture you know as, as you know we've been working with the mining sector as well those in manufacturing as you, I mean, you, you, your, your audience is a is a is a Barbies audience. Is, uh, um, Barbies, of course, is one is, is can, can fairly be described as you know one of the main food baskets, bread baskets of Guyana. Um, so, given that so much of our food supply comes from Barbies, heavily agriculture-based economy, all of the tractors and the combine harvesters and the water pumps and other things that use fuel immediately the fuel bill of those farmers will come down because they'll be buying diesel for 30 percent less than they were buying it before and so that translates into increased cash flow for those businesses uh, potentially uh, making um, uh, cash available cash that would otherwise have been spent on fuel potentially available to expand their operations or to make their business more competitive or to buy more equipment or, or whatever or indeed to generate greater returns for the owners of the business higher profits and so on pay their employees you know or employ more people and whatever um, and so those impacts will be felt like I said that has been announced now that will start taking effect from tonight and will be rolled out during the course of the week um, but that's only really one of um, a number of things that over the years our government has done to you know, really preserve, endeavor to preserve and improve, further enhance the business environment. I, I mean, that announcement is fresh and hot off the press, and you know I suppose is um, is is of great interest because it, it's it's so new, so recent. But there's really a much broader um, gamut of policy initiatives that we've implemented to make sure that the policy environment is favorable. One might risk. argue that um, it is not necessarily something that government should uh, be tapping themselves on the shoulder because w prices on the world market were falling. Uh, my question is, why only now are we realizing this and prices have been falling for some well, time? Well, I'll tell you what, if you study how we have been adjusting um, fuel prices and the taxation on fuel, you will see in fact, and I made the point in the statement that I made earlier today, that we have in place a very effective mechanism designed to cushion the impact of world market price volatility. There have been instances, I gave an instance where um, over a particular time period, the world market price had risen by 184% but the price of the domestic pump had risen by only 77% because we adjusted the tax downwards. At the same time, similarly, when the world market price starts coming down, we adjust the tax back upwards. This is a well-established mechanism that has been in operation for a long time. In addition to that, one doesn't always and automatically see prices at the pump change or the price of a final product change immediately or as soon as one sees the original commodity price moving. I made the point at the press conference today that one doesn't adjust prices every day in response to the volatility that one sees in the world market price. If that was the case, there would have been times when fuel would have been sold for $2,000 in Guyana, but we made sure that we adjust the tax downwards to, to keep the price at a level that would be affordable to the Guyanese consumer. I gave the I gave the example today that you know, even things that are produced by um, any, any manufacturing enterprise, if you do the commod wheat, the wheat price moves up and down. You don't see the price of bread moving every day up and down. And so one has to be assured first of all that, like I said, this 
almost self-regulating mechanism has to be allowed to work. But in addition to that, one has to be assured that it's a sustainable um, price adjustment that you're observing, not just a dip. As you know, the world market price file has been moving very in a very volatile fashion in recent years. So you don't want to be adjusting prices downwards today and then have to adjust them back up tomorrow and so on. So it has to be a sustained pattern, you know, that reflects some steadiness in the price before um, one is assured of um, of uh, of of um, that there's going to be some degree of stability. Um, you, you you mentioned that um, you you mentioned that uh, you know government. Well, to use your phrase, government patting itself on the back. I would say this, that there is no doubt that it is this government that was able to cushion when fuel prices moved on the world market from 46 US dollars a barrel to 146 US dollars a barrel, which was a tripling in the space of just a few years. Um, indeed, just a few months, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. This was around 2007, 2008 period. It is this government that adjusted the tax downward to ensure that the Guyanese consumer didn't have to pay three times as much for fuel. And so we are very proud, and I think justifiably so, we are very proud of the mechanisms and the policies that we've put in place to protect the domestic consumer. And I think that those mechanisms have worked, um, I, I would say they've worked well in a manner that I think we can be, um, I think we can be reasonably pleased in the manner in which they've worked. Protecting the domestic consumer, what happens on the other end? Because when you, you adjust the taxes downwards, the government gets less revenue. How does that affect your ministry? Well, you're absolutely correct. It isn't only a question of how it affects my ministry. And you, the country you, and the you, whole. You are absolutely correct. Um, you make the point, very important point, that when fuel prices go up and we adjust the tax rate downwards to cushion the impact on the, cost, on the consumer, you are absolutely correct that that has a revenue impact, um, and it has a revenue. But bear in mind, government has to collect revenue to provide services too, to pay wages, to pay pensions, to build roads. And I say to persons, I'm glad that you make the point because often you know people feel that well, taxes and they should be paying lower taxes and so on, and that's good. Everybody wants to pay less taxes, but remember that the government has to discharge its revenue collecting function as well. Because the truth of the matter is that it is the revenue that we collected that finances the building of the roads, that finances the digging of the drains, that finances the maintenance of the drainage and irrigation structures, that finances the maintenance of the sea and, de sea, sea and river defense structures, that finances the, expan the uh, um, expansion or modernizing or equipping of our hospitals and our schools. And so you are absolutely correct that every initiative that has the potential to undermine government revenue, has the potential to impact on our ability to do another road or to build another school or to modernize another hospital. So I'm very glad that you make that point. It's a very important nexus. Sometimes I know I go into communities and citizens in those communities say, well, you know, they, they, we speak about some of the bigger projects, you know, we speak about, say, a mile of falls, hydropower project or something. They ask, well, you know, how does that impact on me? And I say to them, any project that generates growth in the economy that increases revenue to the public treasury has the potential to better enable us as a government to meet your needs. Every village that I go into where there's a road that needs to be fixed, I say, I would like to have the capacity to fix every road. But for me to be able to do that, I need to ensure that the economy is growing. I need to ensure that I'm collecting my taxes. I need to ensure that those taxes are used to implement these projects. So I'm glad that you made that nexus. It's a very important nexus sometimes that is overlooked. Very important point. Um, if we were just to go back, you said 30% reduction in fuel cost, gasoline, 42% kerosene oil. Mm. How does this impact on the girl who is going to school, about to write her CSEC exams, living in Little India, Little Africa, Angais Avenue. She has to go to the internet cafe to do printing. She has to take a car to get to school. How does that, how is it likely to impact on her? Well, I will say immediately that given that her parents, we work on the assumption that she lives with her parents or guardians, mm -hmm. 
given that her parents or her guardians now will be saving $300 on every gallon of gasoline that they buy or every gallon of diesel that they buy. That is for every gallon of gas that they would have bought in a week. That's $300 that they will save that can be spent on something else. Mm -hmm. It can be spent potentially on books for her to take to school. It can be spent on exam fees now for her to write maybe that other subject that they were in doubt whether she might be able to afford to write that other subject. It can be spent maybe for her to be able to, um, you, you spoke of going to the internet cafe, it could perhaps be made to use to um, it, um, allow her to have greater access to the internet, whether at the internet cafe or at home. It can be used to help to pay public transportation to ensure that she gets to school on time. Um, it can be spent to buy a better, um, a, a, a more nutritious basket of consumables, a more nutritious basket of food in the market for her and her siblings to eat, um, or whatever it is. And so it goes to the core of an initiative such as this goes to the core of disposable income and increasing disposable income. Mm -hmm. To be used, we don't dictate how people use their disposable income, of course, to be used as the family deems best. I would hope that all of the families in Guyana would be using, would use every dollar of disposable income that they have in an optimal fashion, whether it is to invest in their children's education, whether it is to save, to put on a little extension to their home or to or indeed to build their first home, whether it is to buy their first independent means of transportation. And you have literally thousands of those success stories unfolding before our very eyes. I give the, make the point that I am deeply moved whenever I go to a new housing area. I went to Parfait Harmony, I think a few months ago during this um, education grant um, okay. distribution yep. program. I spoke at a school at Parfait Harmony, and I, wa I wa visited the community and had a look around and so on. I was extremely moved to see young Guyanese families, and sometimes not so young, but ordinary Guyanese families um, building beautiful homes, not necessarily grand, elaborate structures, but very nicely kept, very nicely constructed, neatly constructed, modest homes but homes that they can be very proud of. And these are not people with fancy jobs earning huge incomes. These are, you know, you know, if, if I'm forgiven to, 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 for using the phrase, these are really your average Guyanese citizen holding an average job, not with an extraordinary income, but saving, building their own home. In some instances, setting up a little small business to supplement their income. And it's very moving, very moving to see how many Guyanese families have now become homeowners using their disposable income and their savings, accumulating those over time, going into a bank, demonstrating their credit worthiness, taking a loan, um, building, sometimes even building by self-help, getting their family and so on to help to build their homes. But these are achievements to be proud of. At an individual family level, I think the family that acquires its own home for the first time and maintains that home in a nice, presentable way and keeps their surroundings clean and so on. I think that's an achievement that that family can be immensely proud of. And I think as a country, achievements like those should be replicated as frequently as possible. And as a country, we can be proud of those too. Okay. Before we do run out of time, are there any plans to involve the um, transportation sector in dialogue with a possible outcome of reducing the cost of public transportation? Well, I did make the call publicly today. I did say that as a result of paying $300 or less for gasoline, um, I did make the call that I hope that public tra the public transportation sector responds by lowering their um, lowering their fares. I, I will say that um, I, when, when I did the press conference earlier today in, in Georgetown, I made the point that while utility prices are the subject of regulation, like electricity prices and um, telephone rates and so on are subject to regulation by the Public Utilities Commission, public transportation prices, bus fares and taxi fares, are not the subject of regulation. 
We have on and off had some measure of debate about whether these fears should be the subject of regulation, but thus far we have relied on market forces and we've relied on moral suasion. Um, even if we were to go the route of regulating bus fear, the public transportation fears, I don't think that that could be done overnight. That would mm -hmm. have to follow a process. So in the meantime, we are going to rely on moral suasion, trying to persuade um, the bus operators to, to, to pass on the reduction in, in fuel prices to their, to their customers. In the first instance, that would be our, our, our preference, um, really just simply to persuade them, morally to persuade them, moral suasion, as I said. Um, it remains to be seen whether they respond to this call or not. Let's see how it, things evolve. Utility bills, more particularly GPL, um, are persons likely within the near future to see bills probably being reduced? Well, I'll tell you what, the surest bet for that to be achieved is harnessing of hydropower electricity. Um, you no doubt your viewers have heard of the Amida Falls project. Right now, GPL is dependent on the public treasury for a large subsidy to finance their operations. They get about $9 billion a year in subsidy to help them to be able to deliver power at the prices that are currently being charged, $60 a kilowatt hour, thereabouts. We believe that, you, and, and in fact, not at a level of reliability that we are satisfied with, that I'm satisfied with, or that the government is satisfied with. We would like to see electricity more reliable, less blackouts, fewer blackouts, ultimately to get us to a point where we have no blackouts. And we would like electricity to be more affordable to businesses and to households. For that to be achieved in a sustainable way, we have to move to renewable energy, and hydropower in particular. And the only project that is at the point of being realized for implementation is the Amida Falls project. This is a project that has been studied exhaustively. We've been working diligently for years with potential partners, including um, provide, prov financial institutions, providers of financing. And we are at a point, I believe, where, as the president announced recently, we hopefully should be able to achieve financial close and commence construction shortly later this year. That project, I believe, offers the greatest prospect of more solving this problem with electricity unreliability and the problem with the cost of electricity to the, co to the consumers right now. Okay. I cannot have you as a guest and we do not talk about the budget. The 2014 budget, I think it expires at the end of March, at the end of the first quarter. Well, technically, it's a little bit more complicated than that because the budget, strictly speaking, is for the year. So mm -hmm. budget 2014 would technically have the appropriations associated with budget 2014 would, technically speaking, would have expired at the end of 2014. What the Constitution does is it allows up to the end of March for the tabling of a new budget for the new year. So you are correct that we have up to the end of March for the tabling of a new budget for 2015. The Constitution is quite clear about this. It allows us to um, continue the operations of government until a budget is tabled, um, which has to be done by the end of March. We are working within government with this constitutional um, requirement in mind. And I will be ready to prepare a budget and table one in Parliament, ready to table one in Parliament, I should say, within this constitutional deadline, once the parliamentary conditions are um, are, are, are in place. The Constitution is also clear about what happens when a parliament is dissolved in relation to the budget. And so whether or not a budget goes to parliament before the end of March really will depend on what happens with the 10th parliament. If the 10th parliament, if the prorogation comes to an end and the 10th parliament is resumed, then a budget will be tabled by the end of March. If, on the other hand, the 10th parliament is not resumed but is dissolved before the end of March, then the relevant constitutional provisions will kick in for that. Um, does that include 
having a supplementary budget, having a, a mini budget, something? Oh, no, no, no. The Constitution is quite clear. It's, I mean, what it does, it's, it, it allows government to continue operating until such time as a budget is tabled. But there are constitutional deadlines. So in the normal scheme of things, assuming that you had an ongoing parliament with no prorogation, no dissolution, a budget is required to be tabled by the end of March. In the interim, the law is clear that government can continue to fund its operations. Um, the normal services of government can continue to be provided. The Constitution provides for that. The Constitution then goes on to say that in the event that the parliament is dissolved, prior to the tabling of the budget, that is prior to the end of March, then the Constitution allows for the normal services of government to continue to be provided until after an election would have been held and until after the parliament would have resumed sitting, and then after that the budget is required to be tabled, and the constitution has relevant provisions to govern that. So even in that eventuality, the operations of government continue, the normal services of government continue. You mentioned two things which forces me to ask another question. You said um, you'll be ready to present a budget by the end of March, before the end of March. That's one. Parliamentary conditions permitting. Yeah. You'll be ready. That's one. Mm. We also spoke about the tenth parliament possibly being dissolved. My question. Well, I was taking my cue really from you. You spoke yeah. very authoritatively about there being <laughs> elections this year, so I thought maybe you had some inside information on this matter. My question: Do you have plans to continue in government? Oh, well, well, that one took me a little bit by surprise. I um. I. It has been my great privilege to have been um, in the service of the people of Guyana and to have served under two presidents in the cabinets of two presidents, that is President Jagdeo and President Ramatar. Um, I believe that they are still, I'm extremely pleased with what we have achieved as a government under indeed both presidents, um, both, both presidents with whom I, under mm -hmm. whom I served, in whose cabinets I served. Um, I would say unapologetically that much has been achieved by us as a country. But we're under, as a, as a government, as a, as a party, we're under no illusion, illusions about our work being done. I think there's still work to be done. And we are committed as a party and as a government to continue to do that work. And it would be my privilege to continue to be a part of that, uh, that work. Um, you're a senior minister. You've been with this government for quite a while. How many years? I've um, been and serving in the parliament I've area. been minister now since 2006. 2006. That's eight years. Do you have plans or thoughts of um, moving to a more senior position? Well, there are not that many, and I don't think there are any vacancies right now, so I'm quite happy where I am. Minister, thank you very, very much for your time with us on Talking the Point. We would hope that we can have you on another program where we can look at more issues surrounding what happens, how Guyanese look, and Barbicians more particularly, look at the elections, the decisions that has to be taken, and maybe you can see, because I know um, persons from the opposition will try to influence the decisions that persons make. They have to make those decisions ultimately when they go to the poll. But what happens then will be based on what you're told. And maybe we can have you so we can discuss some of the issues surrounding, some Absolutely. other issues surrounding the election. It would be my great pleasure, Andrew. Thank you very much. I'd and thank you very pleasure. much thank you again. Very, thank you very much. This thank has you. been Making the Point. On this edition, we had a brief chat with the, the finance minister, Dr. Ashni Singh. Join me again for another program, Making the Point. I'm your host, Andrew Carmichael.